airplane hangar. It, it, it is full of helicopters and a couple of airplanes. Uh, I am with Gallatin County Search and Rescue, a couple of volunteers, and then a full timer. We got uh, Riff, Jason Raveski, we have Mark Bradford, and Gary Clutter. Guys, tell me quickly what, what your jobs are with Search and Rescue. So um, I'm with the Big Sky section. Um, we have about 35 members in Big Sky, and I'm in charge of those 35 members on any given time. All right. And I run the uh, helicopter program. The helicopter manager is my, my title for the county. All right. And? Yeah, um, I work for the Gallatin County Sheriff's Office in the Search and Rescue Division and oversee training and operations. And we're out near the airport, and tell me what we're sitting in front of with this majestic beast behind us. Um, so we're, we're here at uh, Central Helicopters um, main hangar um, at the airport, and behind us is um, our primary uh, platform for doing rescue uh, work in, in the county and uh, to our, all of our mutual aid partners throughout the state and in adjoining states. And uh, this is a uh, A-Star B3E series helicopter um, that is a fantastic high altitude uh, platform to, to do work off of. And, um, and we do standard uh, helicopter rescue, um, but we mostly uh, do a short haul rescue with it, which is utilizing a fixed line under the helicopter to do technical insertions and extractions of patients. Okay. And all of your training, all of your rescue missions are all with this helicopter? Yes. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And she runs pretty good. She's in a, a very pretty shape from the exterior. Yeah, mostly just to the grocery store and back. <laughs> yeah. You get it done. All right, I'm going to start very quickly with a, a warning that was put out by Gallatin County uh, Sheriff Search and Rescue. This is the 19th of March. It's Equinox, the first official day of spring. Uh, Gallatin County Search and Rescue would like to remind outdoor recreators at all times to be prepared for avalanche, fire, flood, sunburn, fast moving water, lightning, slippery ice, blizzard, extreme heat, extreme cold, gusting winds, bear, moose, sasquatch, bison encounters, quicksand, mudslides, landslides, rock slides, hot metal slides at the playground, meteor strikes, and super volcano. Did you guys leave anything out or that uh, pretty much sum would, it up? Yeah. What's a typical call uh, type of list that we'd, we'd expect to get a call from for okay. the most part? <laughs> Haven't done the slide thing yet. <laughs> so this time of year, it's just a little bit of everything. It can be for sure, yeah. yes. And what are you seeing this year? Well, uh, Mark, why don't you talk about yeah. some of the calls you've had? Yeah, in Big so Sky. in Big Sky this uh, winter, we've had uh, probably uh, the typical amount of calls that we've had um, in the last 10 years. Um, we get a lot of snowmobile accidents in Big Sky, uh, people running off the trail, um, running into a tree, hitting a rock, that kind of stuff. And then also guys kind of exploring and going places they shouldn't go, um, getting themselves caught in places they can't get out of. Um, or are lost and, and don't know where they are um, calling for help and, and we come, come find them. Uh, we typically get a few uh, backcountry ski incidents during the winter. Uh, we had one early season up in uh, Beehive Basin with a broken leg. Uh, so it's been a typical, uh, typical year for us with just the different stuff that's happened. Yeah. And you two are volunteers. How many volunteers are associated with Gallatin County Search and Rescue? Um, it, it's kind of a fluid number, but uh, okay. typically about 130. 130. That seems like an awful lot to keep track of. It Are is. you coordinating that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how fluid is that? Do you just always have new volunteers coming in and always have yeah. other old volunteers exiting? We're, we're really fortunate that we don't have a tremendous amount of turnover. Um, people typically join search and rescue, and I'd say 10 years is a, a pretty average um, uh, commitment that we get from people but we do again we do have a certain amount of attrition so we're bringing new people on and um, you know all, always keeping up with with that to, to a certain extent but we, we are a very busy search and rescue organization yeah. uh, we are by a, a, quite a margin the busiest in the state of Montana um, and um, probably one of the busiest um, in, in the Rocky Mountain region 
and as the popularity of this area has increased, it's become a destination and a greater population in the area. Have you seen those uh, your workload expand? Yeah, and, and uh, not exponentially, but yes, it, it just continues to creep up every year because uh, people don't move here for the shopping, right? <laughs> they, they're all moving here for outdoor recreation, right? And. Uh, by no fault of theirs, people do at times get injured or lost or or anything else um, while they're recreating in, in the outdoors, and yeah. so that just creates a need for us to um, to help address that. And um, it, it's a it's a misnomer that most of our calls are for visitors. They're, they're not. Most of our calls are for people that that actually live here. Okay. And, and, Again, everybody at some point, if you do enough outdoor recreation, everybody gets hurt yeah. at some point. And that's what we're here for. And people have medical emergencies when they're in the backcountry. We respond to people having heart attacks or strokes or diabetic emergencies or seizures. So uh, it's not just the injuries. Yeah. It's, it's anything that can happen to you in, in your day-to-day -day life can happen to you when you're in the back country. It's not always just a Floridian who took a wrong turn. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. But it is sometimes. I've taken more wrong <laughs> turns than any Floridian or Californian or anybody else who's out there. Rest assured that okay. I can beat them all. Well, but it does sound like with the volunteers, there is a certain amount of burnout factor. Do you guys, do you feel like you can't relax necessarily are you sort of always on call how does that work in terms of you know is, is the phone uh just liable to go off at any moment well put you on the clock you know we're always on call when we choose to put ourselves on call um except for in the helicopter program we do designate uh, one person in the county to be um, a go-to person for aviation questions from anyone that might need any deputy uh, or SAR command. Um, but um, I'd say we're pretty well rounded. I don't know of anybody who stays up at night worrying about the next call. Um, we all know when we to expect a call and we're mostly surprised when we don't on a, after a big snow or a big event, um, high water. Uh, hopefully we'll have some high water this year. Um, but. Um, I don't know of anybody who sits around and just waiting for a call. Now, I know people who really like to go on calls. They, they are they're always ready to go. Yeah. But I haven't really seen too many people losing sleep over, over that. Okay. Now, maybe Riff. I'm not sure. <clears throat> yeah, out of our 35 members, on any given point, you know, we'll get a call uh, any time of the day or night. And you don't have to respond. Um, but you can see it on your phone when it's coming in on our paging system yeah. that it's like, oh, we're a little bit light. And, you know, there's times where you rearrange your life and, you know, get out the door because you see that, you know, there's not enough people responding. So we kind of kind of ebb and flow that way. But you're not, you know, handcuffed that you have to be responding as a volunteer on every single call. Right. We do have each team and each section has uh, imposed limits, uh, minimums of amount of uh, calls they have to make in order to stay in good standing and also training hours. Um, so it's just not, you get to go to the good calls. We want people to show up when we, when we ask for them. And, and we have really good, we have tremendous uh, uh, number of volunteers who just, they put in a lot of hours. Yeah. And it does sound like you can kind of look up at the sky and say, okay, today we're probably gonna get a call. What, what percentage of the time does it work out that way versus it, it's a total surprise and catches you off guard? I mean, I tell new members this, that when they join, the, I said, if you're sitting around on a Sunday afternoon thinking, hmm, I'm just watching football, I don't have a lot to do, that's when the calls come in. Okay. It, it, it's not necessarily true. It's usually, you know, Christmas Eve and you're heading to church and yep. you're having to ditch your family and change your plans and move on and or it's at night and you know 11 o'clock at night or so they do come at all times and it's hard to plan you know when they're going to happen yeah <laughs> yeah you've just fired up the barbecue and 10 of your best friends are coming through the front door and you ditch ditch everyone and 
your wife may not be happy that, um, or in a lot of cases, the husbands aren't happy because it's the wife going out the door. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, I'd say okay. your families are as important to this as the volunteers Absolutely. as the volunteers yeah. are because it, there's times I missed my own company Christmas party um, and made my wife handle they it. They probably have a we, better time. <laughs> yeah, <there. laughs> for sure. So it, it definitely the families are a huge part of it. Uh, yeah. You know, letting us do the things that we do. Mm-hmm. And are you excited when you get a call? It's I mean, to an extent, you got to be into this, right? To to volunteer this way for this to be the way that you spend your time. You gotta love it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's not that you might like doing it. You really need to like doing this. Um, and it's contrary to a lot of people's opinion. It's not about um, the excitement of the call. Um, for when you talk to our members, I mean, it's fun to fly in a helicopter and do that. Uh, but it's really rewarding to help people. That's okay. why. It's, it's kind of a, a way to give back to the community because we've all drawn for this community for our lives here. And um, it's important because um, they are our friends out there. We've, we've picked up SAR members before um, who have had an equipment failure or got caught in an avalanche or got sick or just fill in the blank. And uh, it former, could, former guest on the podcast, right. yeah. Jeremy Blythe and Rudy right. Norlander, Kissy Bear. Right. We both talked about uh, being helped by search and rescue, yeah. and they could not have been more grateful um, yeah. for what you guys do. So thank you. I, I probably should have led with that. Thank you for <laughs> for everything that you do. Uh, but I, I'm bad at my job. Thank, thankfully, you guys are good at yours. Um, a lot of off-grid situations, you know, that's definitely a component of your rescues. What kind of technology allows you to communicate in those areas? Uh, I, I'd say our primary form of communication is, is radios. Um, we, we can uh, y- utilize uh, a number of different uh, forms of infrastructure. We have our own county radio system with repeater sites throughout the county. We can utilize the Forest Service's uh, radio system with repeaters. They have a lot of, um, uh, of radio repeaters on top of mountains and in pretty remote areas. They're solar sites. So there, there's no electricity to that site. Yeah. Um, and then our, our backup is we use inReach, you know, Garmin inReach devices a lot. Does everybody have one of those? We, the, the, as an organization, we have a lot of okay. them. So it, nobody goes, a team never goes into the field without one because they allow, if, if our radios can't hit that repeater and we just can't make contact, we can text through the inReach device and give updates of mm-hmm. where we are and if we've gotten to the patient yet and what the needs are yeah. for, for the mission. So um, th- those are our two. Pro- so, in some places we can use cell phones. Um, you know, Beehive Basin's a great place yeah. where you get on your cell phone and talk yeah. and and if you need to communicate. Yeah, um, a call yesterday at Blackmore, the uh, fellow called 911 from from the Avalanche site and. And then our, our uh, coordinators were in, able to dis- talk with them and get real information about what the situation was before we even left the, the um, SAR building. Okay. And is this part of the, the new feature that I see on my phone where even when I'm in a remote area, it seems like I can make an emergency call out? You can. So with the iPhone 14, uh, it does have a, a satellite-based alerting system on yeah. it. It's a little different than the Garmin inReach in that uh, there's no uh, means of two-way communication. So uh, a, a person can get a message out that they have an emergency. But our 911 center and our own SAR comms center, because we, we put up our own comms center for every call, and they do all of the technology piece of tracking and mapping. Um, that, um, the iPhone 14, there's just no way to talk back to them. Yeah. So, but it, it, it's better than, better than nothing. Nothing. Because yeah. sure. we, we can get solid coordinates for where they are, and that is a big piece of uh, the puzzle for us on any rescue or search is that that location if if there were one message that you could deliver to everyone who's going outdoors to recreate in gallatin county in terms of like preparing yourself what what's 
that message? Well, my, my broken record piece is always plan for the worst day, not the best. Because we're all guilty of it's a sunny day outside, you're going to go out for a quick ski for a couple hours, and you're you really the binding. Yeah, you're really thinking about, yeah, this is going to be fun. I mean, the snow, I don't know if the snow will be good or bad, but otherwise it'll be fun. Yeah. Um, All but, I need is a beer. <laughs> but the minute you break your leg and you can't move anymore, your plan for the best day has, has just uh, gone south. And yeah. so that, that idea of being prepared to spend the night out, that's what I usually advise people is just being, and, and it, it can manifest itself in different forms because um, a night out in the summer is a little different than a night out in the winter. But just having enough clothing, um, water, food, which food's really low on the list. We can go weeks without eating. Sure. It's, it's a comfort thing to be able to snack on something. Uh, but Is it water and warmth, basically? Yeah, water and warmth. Yeah. You know, a way to get yourself off the ground, whether that's having a small saw to cut tree limbs to make pine bowel, because the, the earth really saps the heat out of the human body. It's a really big piece of thermal mass, this earth of ours. <laughs> and it, and um, it, you'll never beat that by sitting or laying on the ground. It's yeah. always gonna keep pulling heat out of your body. So a way to isolate yourself from the ground, a way to stay warm um, and making a fire is a huge survival tool that um, so many people, um, I, I guess, don't, don't, don't keep in mind how difficult it can be to start a fire. We think about going camping in the summer and everything's dry and, and you can just start picking off some little sticks and, and make a fire. But when everything's wet and you have to dig a hole in the snow and, and you need a, a really solid means of, of making a fire. Yeah. Because sitting by a fire is 100% better than not sitting by a fire. <laughs> When, when it's cold out. Uh, Mark just did it, uh, how many weeks? Three weeks? A couple weeks? weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, where they had, to, they had to find these snowmobilers who were stuck in this, in this creek bottom and nobody could get out at that point because it was so bad and they had to make a fire and huddle around the fire and I'm sure you would agree, it's way better. Yeah, it makes the, it makes the night go a little quicker when you have a fire to sit yeah. by. Yeah. For sure. But yeah. that's that, you know, going out prepared. You know, we left the, left the house at 6.30 that night thinking this was going to be a pretty easy call yeah we'll get in get them get out get home go to bed but 11 30 comes around and you're like man we're not getting out of here tonight and hopefully you have the right stuff to build a fire and drink some water and stay warm for the night. yeah we uh, make a lot of fires for people <laughs> just like that we had an ice climber rescue this year that we had to spend uh, about three and a half hours with and fire was it. I mean, it really kept him warm. It kept us warm. It, it really makes a huge difference. Make your coffee, roast your marshmallows. We actually have our, our, our folks have kits with jet boils in them so we can actually Sweet. make some hot chocolate for people if you're against Cup of sitting. soups, things like that. Yeah, yeah. It can make a huge difference. Really turn people around, I'm guessing. All right, so we what, paid it lip service. One of the things I would add to the list of things yeah. to do, uh, besides having the equipment, is to really guard your your cell phone battery um, especially if you're in an incident where you've made contact with us don't start posting on social media don't do anything that takes battery um, take good care of it because numerous calls we've been in the middle of a rescue and we lose contact with the patient we still found them but it's really not um, the ideal if yeah. I mean people call their families Hey, I'm okay. That's good, but don't call everybody and take good care of your, and then your batteries. And the other is, if you see an unknown number coming in and you've called 911, go ahead and answer it. Answer it's them. probably us. It's not a telemarketer. No, it's not a telemarketer. It's us wanting to know, are you on a cliff or do we can we land near you? I mean, yeah. We're going to ask you some very pertinent information before we start loading the helicopter up. Okay. Practically speaking, in your own personal lives, when you go out, you know, on a picnic with the family, are you following this advice? Are you prepared for things to to turn south? I, my kit, I can spend the night 
with uh, pretty much uh, whatever I have in my pack. Okay. It, it changes. Uh, it sounds I like may, we're about to take off. I may ask that again. <laughs> <laughs> that is, what, and what is that out there that's that looks about like to take a off? Small jet. Okay. For a small jet, it's kicking out a lot of volume. They're probably doing some maintenance on it. Little, a little break uh, for the <laughs> insanely loud jet engine outside. Uh, so you were telling me, Gary, in, in your personal life, what are the precautions that you take on, on a, like a daily basis going out with the family recreating? When I, when I go out, depending on the time of year, but uh, my pack always has what I would, would expect to be able to pass the evening, spend the night in the woods, um, and uh, it changes seasonally, but some kind of a, a warm layer, a little puffy rain jackets, something like that always have a hat, uh, maybe a balaclava, anything that will keep me warm, fire making, and a little bit of food and water. I can be miserable, but I'm not going to be dead. Um, I've, we've flown so many missions looking for people who took a walk from uh, somewhere in Big Sky and ended up on top of the Spanish Peaks. And they call us at dark and they're in a t-shirt and shorts. Yeah. And they haven't had anything to eat or drink and they want us to come get them. But they're not sure where they are. And then their cell phone goes dead, so. And it's that sort of like domino effect yeah. that can lead to, you know, the, you guys getting called out or people and ending up in bad situations. I think that might lead to the next thing is, if you think you might need help, don't wait to too long to ask for it. Okay. It's easy to turn us around, but if you wait um, till it gets dark, um, that severely limits our options. Nighttime is not our friend. And, um, and we get in a hurry, because a lot of times we're up against day, losing daylight, especially if we're bringing aviation into the mix. We, yeah. don't, we don't fly at night, so. Um, the helicopter does not fly at night. Mm -mm. Got it, okay. Dusk. Twilight, yep. yes, but yep. as soon as it is night, night, yep. we're yep. just not flying. And that just safety. They can't see. Yeah, it's yeah. We we don't we're not equipped with night vision goggles. Yeah. Uh, for this aircraft, so yeah, it's it's yeah. We can fly at twilight. We just did a ice climber rescue, a, a, a separate one than the one I mentioned earlier, and it was right at twilight that we were able to do a quick insertion and, and with short haul him off the climb. Okay. He'd broken his back and we we had to do it super fast because doing it as a, um, a ground-based rescue um, is, is a very long and, and technical ice climb and it would have taken, I don't know, eight hours to, I mean, similar to what Jeremy's situation was, but even worse because it's ice, not rock. And yeah. that just makes it, even more complicated from okay. a technical aspect. Yeah. What, what is the most complicated type of, of rescue or activity that you have to tend to? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, vertical, probably. Yeah, I mean, the vertical environment definitely, um, it, it just, it, it adds a, a three or four layers of complexity to, to the call. Uh, oftentimes it means um, we have to be inserted um, to a spot above mm -hmm. the patient and then rappel down, bringing medical equipment and anything to treat the patient. And then oftentimes we'll have to lower to at least a, somewhat of a reasonable ledge um, in order for the helicopter to come back and pick us off. It's very difficult um, to, uh, to pick somebody off of um, a, a vertical face um, when they're suspended by a rope because you get into this condition where if if the helicopter comes and you hook up to it now the helicopter's anchored to the rock oh, wow. and that's a really uh, precarious mm -hmm. uh, environment for a, a pilot to work is being anchored to anything um, with that line so most um, most organizations and there aren't even that many that do short haul don't 
won't work in that environment. Yosemite uh, National Park climbing rangers are, are ones that do because they have such big wall climbs that they just they can't, have to. Yeah, they have to. They, they have to. They can't lower down to the next ledge or pitch yeah. because it, it is so much uh, vertical rock and it's a complicated uh, procedure. So yeah, the tech, yeah, and then and then calls that are very um, makes me anxious just listening to you describe. <laughs> yeah, calls that are very um, medically complicated. Um, the backcountry is not a great place to practice medicine. It, yeah, it just isn't. Um, uh, I've, I've been a paramedic for a long time, and it's so much better to work in an ambulance. It's so much better sure. to work in a hospital. It, the the backcountry is just medical equipment doesn't function in the cold the way it does in a hospital um, whether that's a suction device or an, a piece of airway um, uh, you know securing equipment or um, starting an IV on somebody yeah. uh, you, it, the IV line will freeze like there's so many complications so when we have a, a patient who has a lot of medical um, issues that can be very challenging in and of itself it's not challenging technically with ropes and pulleys and carabiners, but it's, it's, it's a challenge to okay. stabilize them enough to fly. Uh, Rudy is one of those patients that luckily um, didn't actually from us require a lot of medical care other than very careful positioning of his airway that he was in a downward facing yeah. position because had he been rolled on his back, he, he likely would not have survived um, without an ability to c control his airway. So, but there was not much else you could do for him. Uh, we did some medically. quick bandaging of some wounds he yeah. had on his legs, um, but I don't think we were on scene for more than, I don't know, eight or nine minutes. Um, it was just about getting him in the air. In and away from the bear. Yeah. And away from because the bear. Because that was one of the, <laughs> again, that was one of the complications of that call is we had an unaccounted for bear that, oh, wow. that had attacked yep. him. So that was one of the cases where we actually short hauled in with a deputy with a long rifle okay. to provide cover for us in order to package the patient and get, get him out safely. So let, I'm, I'm sort of processing all of this, but the way that you're describing your job, it seems like you need to be trained as an EMT. You need to be trained as, as some sort of like tra trauma coach. And uh, sometimes you're dealing with wildlife. Sometimes you're dealing with extreme sports situations where you need to ski or you need to snowmobile or, uh, you know, rappel, free climb, whatever. How long is the training period for volunteers? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really tricky piece <laughs> yeah. for us because there are, there are things that we can teach people. And then there are things that we cannot teach. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I could not teach um, a volunteer that, want, that wants to, to work with us to snowmobile as well as Mark snowmobiles. And that's just the way it is. Yeah. It, we can't take somebody out for a few weekends and, and ride around on snowmobiles and get them to the level of proficiency. So we actually have to recruit people that are coming to us with a certain skill set. It's the same with skiing. I, we do, there is not enough training hours to teach somebody to be a really solid backcountry skier and, yeah. and have those skills. Or, um, or rock climbing or kayaking or, yeah, yeah right? Yeah, yeah, on and on and on of all the different stuff. That so you just have to take advantage of the skills that people bring to the job. That is correct. So when, when, when we are recruiting new members, we'll oftentimes go through our teams, uh, whether that's our swift water team or our snowmobile folks or our dive team, and we'll look for wh where, where are we getting thin? And, and we'll say, we need snowmobilers right now. So we will look for people. And you ask snowmobilers, we ask Mark, who do you know? That, right. Who's talked to you about it that, you know, is a good snowmobiler? Yeah. So we're always on uh, the lookout for talent. You know, and we're blessed because of our environment. We have a lot of talent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people who are interested? Yes. Yes. So the personnel is not necessarily a, a shortcoming at this point. Uh, resources what what is search and rescue hurting for at this point uh, hmm. 
Well, that hovercraft is yeah, looking yeah, they, really uh, good. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Just bigger and better toys. Yeah. So, you know, we're always um, trying to improve our service delivery model in the end. And whether that's training people up medically or, um, you know, replacing um, some of our capital assets to have a better boat. Um, you know, we, we use an inflatable uh, boat with a motor on it that has a jet pump to do, you know, moving water rescue. And we're always, we're always trying to say, well, how, could, how could we be doing this better, safer, more efficiently uh, to provide for better care uh, to our customers, which is our community. Right. And, and so that's always kind of this ongoing need yeah. uh, in SAR. Uh, currently, our, one of our big projects is um, we, we work with Central Helicopters. We've contracted with them for many years, but we, we've only ever been able to afford what's known as just as, as available contract. That means if they're here, if our two pilots, one of them is here and the helicopter's here, we can fly a mission. Yeah. If, if one of those pieces is missing, we can't fly a mission. So um, w one of our big uh, projects of late is that we, we're trying to find a mechanism to create a more consistent um, service delivery model for helicopter rescue. Okay. Yeah. So that you get that all access any time of the day, yep. 24 seven. Yep. Yeah, I hear you. All right. And there's a number of ways to do that. And um, we're, we're keeping all of our options open from what they call an exclusive use contract where yep. you pay money and you have it available to owning a helicopter and hiring our own pilots. Like there's lots of different ways um, I shouldn't say there's lots. There's a few different ways to accomplish it. Yeah. And um, we're certainly open to um, to suggestions we get from other providers and from yeah, yeah. anybody interested in helping. And we interface with our peer groups. There are other helicopter teams that have their exercise. They're using different models that we, we have. And we look at them and talk to them about how they've funded their specific programs. And it's, it's a big lift. Okay. It seems like you're doing all right, though. If, that, if that's the only thing yeah. piece of, that's missing from the puzzle, yeah. you're doing all right. So that, that's all the little questions that I have. We're going to quit messing around now and get to some war stories. Okay, this game is called Search and Rescue Exclamations. All right, I'm going to give you a phrase that was in your head during one of your calls for service. All right, it starts. It starts kind of light. What a dummy. So between the three of you, you got to come up with one situation you were in where you thought, oh, what a dummy when you got there. I'm sure these two guys have said that about me. I was going to say, when we, <laughs> so uh, many times. Watching like, Riff put on his harness backwards. Yeah, that, I'm like sure. That. It could be about a fellow search um, and rescue Usually operator. it's about ourselves. Yeah, um, I honestly. forgot something or whatever. Give me a specific I'm time you remember think. where you're like, oh, what a dummy. We never, that never applies to our, our customers, by the way. Yeah, it, it is sure. all about, you know, because seriously, we, we don't judge. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, if I'm ever in that situation, I'll thank you. In we advance. would judge you. Okay. Oh, big no, time. Please, go yeah. Ahead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I said it to myself, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, on, on the, the bear attack call, because I, I had forgotten one of my, I hadn't forgotten. I left my connection point that we use to connect to the helicopter uh, inside my backpack, and, had to is, send like, it and I should have had it hanging on my harness. Type. Yep. It is is a modified. Now I was able to just use a regular locking carabiner to okay. make it happen. So it's it's not the end of the world. But I was kind of like, what a, what a dummy! I left. Right. It's in the bottom, and it was in the bottom of my backpack. And there's all this medical equipment, and everything crammed on top of it. And I definitely thought, what a dummy! Okay. So yeah. uh, I s flew a mission in uh, on Lion's Head in West Yellowstone a number of years ago. We got out of the helicopter. Uh, predecessor to this aircraft and my partner he had his handheld radio in his hand and he was getting skis off the helicopters and he laid the hel laid the radio on the helicopter skid and then it, as the helicopter flew away he was oh, like no <laughs> and the helicopter got away and it chipped just a little bit it was somebody we know and we saw the radio do a deep dive down into this canyon oh. and it was like yeah, what a dummy. Yeah, um, right. it's still so there, no doubt. 
Um. All right, we'll move on to the next one. That doesn't look right. Hmm. That doesn't look I'm, right. I'm thinking like medical issues is usually when you come up on somebody and their leg or arm yeah. is in the wrong direction. Okay. And like, Have just, you had that one of those recently? Right. Um, that beehive basin injury um, was a, a kind of a funky angle. This was the broken leg? Yep. Okay. But there's been a, a, a few over the years that you pull up and you're like, boy, that that's not the position you should be in. Yeah. Is it normally a compound <laughs> fracture? Would it? Yeah. Typically on those, it will be. Yeah. Something that erupts. Yeah. All right. It's pretty gnarly. Anything else? That doesn't look great. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, I remember flying, um, again, to try to tie points together here, but on, on with Jeremy's climbing fall, when we, we were doing the, the our recon flight, which is what we do first to just scan the situation yeah. and then take whatever plan we had and make any modifications. Because when we're flying there, we're always making a plan of, okay, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do this. And then we get there and actually look at it and say, no, that's not gonna work. But I remember <laughs> looking at where, finally seeing him on the rock face and then um, looking up to see where his, his last piece of protection was. And it was really, really high you saw and, how far he and fell. i saw how far and you and you just you have to double that right and and i said that doesn't look right <laughs> there's got to be something <laughs> wrong with that equation but how it is, was right how is he still alive right i mean completely that how is he still alive uh, like can that really be his his his, his piece of protection way up there yeah that's a big whipper so all yeah. right uh that's a great one all right how about this one? Oh, it's gonna be a long day that ice climber, that first yeah. ice climber yeah. injury. Yeah. yeah, we, um, so me and uh, two other guys from SAR were actually ice climbing that, that day. We got down to the parking lot at Grotto Falls and we were just taking our boots off. And uh, I heard over the radio that there was an ice climber injury. So um, we immediately put our boots back on. I called into the, our valley base, uh, our comm center, and found out where it was. And the moment we heard what, what climb it was, um, and and then so we decided that's all the information you needed though you didn't need to see the condition of yeah the, the so climber. we put on headlamps because it gets dark so early in the winter time and, and the three of us headed up there and got to the patient and when we got to the patient and saw where he was and saw the condition that he was in we said this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be a journey yeah for sure okay. and, and it was but yeah because he he was badly badly injured yeah. and and yeah, we knew this was going to, because it was nighttime at this point. We knew we couldn't fly uh, one four Fox. So um, we knew we were going to have to call a resource from a long way away, which was two bear air out of Kalispell. And he was, he required so much medical attention that it was, yeah, this no. is going to be, we're in it for the long haul on this one. All right. Yeah. That's a good one. E either you guys got one for that I one? I mean, I would say it, it usually is after you've been out recreating all day snowmobiling mm -hmm. or climbing or whatever and yeah you're wet and you're tired and you're hungry and then you get a search and rescue call and you're you know 10 minutes away from the trailhead and turn around and do it all over again with wet clothes on so, man yeah. it seems like anytime you know that it's going to be a nighttime rescue that's sort of part of the math yeah there, yeah right yeah, or you've just finished one at night and it's 10 o'clock at night and you get another call uh, um, and now it's going to be four o'clock. So the dreaded two banger. Yeah, okay. one on top of the other. Um, All right. Uh, how about this one? Ooh, I'm not sure what I'm looking at. Um, <laughs> Who's got one? <laughs> I was thinking about Gary changing at the building. I was... Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'd say uh, even though we did know what we were looking at, looking at a uh, plane crash uh, above Venice Lake, it's like, how can that be an airplane? Okay. Where it is, what is it, it is. a small craft? Yeah, uh, yeah, three person. Three person. Three passengers. Uh, uh, I think it was a twin. Um, um, and just... You know what an aircraft looks like. We've been looking for an aircraft from this helicopter for an hour. And then when you see it, people are like, yeah, there it is. And your brain doesn't wrap around that that's actually an aircraft. Yeah. 
it no longer looks like yeah. a, what no. you expect an aircraft to no. look like. No. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a good one. All right. I have one more, and I want one story out of each of you. Oh, boy. Uh, holy mother of God, nothing in my body was prepared to see this. <laughs> What's the one that, that stands out that's like just it was shocking uh, to, to see it? I mean, I'd say for whatever reason, not to go too dark here, but um, this is it, it, it's a death that we were on. It was my first death that I'd been on. Uh, we had a snowmobiler uh, cross in West Yellowstone on some open water at night and didn't really realize they were going across the open water. Yeah. And he drowned. Um, and so the next day we looked for him that night and next day an aircraft flew over and actually saw him uh, in the river and his helmet had so much foam in it that he was actually like bobbing in the river. And I thought, <clears throat> yeah, no big deal. Let's get this guy out. They get him out, get him to shore and uh, pull him up. And, and it's kind of surreal, right? It's not real. He's in snow, full snowmobile gear, helmet on, goggles on, you know, the whole thing. And it's kind of like a, a fake at that point, you know? And, yeah, and, like a dummy. Uh, and I'll never forget the coroner came over and um, he said, uh, can you see if he's got a wallet on him? And pulled the wallet out and, you know, there's a picture of his wife and kids and and then pulls the helmet off of him to ID him and that that's when it gets real and no, that gotcha. yeah that's you're like wow this is this is the real thing yeah so okay so that's mine that is dark yeah how dare you <laughs> sorry <laughs> no thank you for for sure uh, holy mother of god nothing in my body was prepared to see this hey there. uh one of my partners and i we flew in on a again another aircraft accident that had burned on impact and uh, uh, we did the, the uh, recovery from that and that was the one okay yeah that one's the one that, that haunts you a little bit no I just wasn't ready for that okay but you, uh, you know Gary and I both uh, we share similar backgrounds we both had full careers in the fire service um, so obviously have seen a lot of stuff. We had a, a missing um, young uh, man uh, years ago, and um, when we found him, um, he he had hung himself out in the woods in this very dark place, and it was just a really sad call to yeah. think someone has had become that despondent that they did not want to be found. I mean, he, he obviously had gone to a lot of trouble. Went to great lengths. I mean, it wasn't right next to the trail. It was yeah. way off down in a hole like where, and it just. He but, was hiding. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that type of call, um, you know, a lot, a lot of what we see is, is disturbing, but it's standard disturbing. And that, that one was just, it was just a sad call to know. It was, it was a really young person. And then we had to do, um, kind of the acting coroner role of documenting it with pictures and then cutting him down and then flying him out. Yeah. Uh, we actually short hauled him out. Um, and then, and then the family piece of it, yep. you have this young person again, who had become that despondent to do that. So, so that was the one that I, you know, I was definitely not prepared to find, nothing can prepare find him for that like that. And so yeah. often when we are doing body recoveries, the family's at the scene when we bring them out yeah. and nobody's prepared for that and, um, we do our best to insulate the rescuers from that but it's it's part of it you gotta you gotta be made of, of strong stuff to handle that um all right let's do one more as a palate cleanser though how about uh, that's funny i mean obviously it's not a thing that uh that you said when you met me uh <laughs> but what 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 comes to mind when you know you've, you've gone so far out of your way to rescue somebody you go, that's funny. Um, funny. Well, <laughs> the, the, I, none of them are well, ever funny. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. well I, I was telling one of the pilots here earlier a story about one of these helicopters behind us. Uh, another uh, partner and I, we had a call of a sick uh, man up in the uh, Spanish Peaks. Yeah. And this was in the no comms, pre cell phone days. Um, so uh, we flew at dawn, and we flew a very large helicopter. 
and we weren't sure which camp it was. And um, so we went around and woke every camp up oh, nice. at 6 a.m. <laughs> With your loud, large helicopter. Yeah, flattening some tents. Um, <laughs> and uh, it might have not been funny to us, but the, we got a lot of one-finger salutes at dawn. And we did find the, t the crew, and we got him oh, out. Oh, that's good. But it was like, huh, you know. <laughs> That was, they didn't appreciate us hovering over their tent. Just, so it's the innocent we couldn't, bystander. We couldn't get out and that. knock on the door. Right. So, so we had to wake them up somehow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was... Get your little pellet gun out. I uh, know. The, the helicopter did... Yeah. yeah I think we enough. blew a few tents over. <laughs> All right. So I remember a girl that we uh, rescued up in Porcupine and Big Sky. Uh, she came to town with her husband who was playing in a band for a wedding. And so she said, oh, I'm going to go up for a hike. And found a local trailhead and walked out in shorts and a tank top and no water and dark came and she wasn't back and they called and so we went up there and I was actually on my dirt bike and heading down the trail and I see this girl like a single trail middle of nowhere right and like waving me down like <laughs> like <laughs> finally yeah, like nobody's you know like I wasn't gonna see her like I was gonna run her over her savior get get off the dirt bike and she's like can I give you a hug and I said yeah, you bet. Like, and she's just like, and then all of a sudden gives she just me a, wanted your a great big kiss. And she's like, oh, oh my I'm God. so happy to see you. <laughs> Sometimes the like, job has its yeah, perks. Yeah, I was like, Riff, wow, okay. Riff has never had that. <laughs> That's not happened. No, not even the dogs we've no. rescued. You're, it's because you're, you don't have the snowmobile skills. That's, That's right. Is. That is correct. <laughs> All right, that, that's all I got for you guys. Thank you so much. It was, this was uh, Jason Raveski, Mark Bradford, and Gary Clutter. You guys are, are great for giving me some of your time. I know you're extremely busy, but uh, walking me through your equipment and, um, and some of your war stories and knowledge has been fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm.